hi, welcome to Women vs. Everything, a podcast about modern and historical women who overcame adversity and became their badass selves and changed the world for the better. Uh, this is my lovely co-host Jess. Hello! And I'm Grace, and every week one of us chooses a woman to talk about, and the other one is just given the date that that woman was alive and has to research that kind of blind. And so far that format has been really fun and yielded kind of interesting bits of history and context that we wouldn't otherwise think about. Yeah, absolutely. So we've been just kind of stitching it all together on the show as we go and seeing seeing what happens. And so far it seems to be working. Speaking of things that seem to be working, we've been getting trolled for the first time this week, um, which has been really fun. It started out, I think, because we talked about uh, a trans woman two episodes ago, and we've also uh, been in early discussions about bringing an awesome trans feminist on the podcast. And yeah, we've had the had the turfs and the the rad femmes coming after us. Shockingly, who could have seen that coming? <laughs> but yeah, I think if we're getting trolled by bigots, I think we're doing something right. Frankly, yeah, absolutely. And similarly, we also had, among the many places you can find us on, we also have a YouTube channel and a lovely man decided to leave a comment there about our episode about a trans woman. Yeah. But I just think it's really important for us to acknowledge that this is this is an inclusive podcast and this is a podcast that tries to include all women. If people don't like that, then okay, this is maybe not the show for them, but we're not going to stop. Yes, exactly. And um, thank you to, I don't know, is it Tanya or Tanja the Awesome on YouTube, who left a really lovely comment about that episode about Mary Jones. They especially liked that it was perspective outside of America. Yeah, we also really welcome positive feedback and you can get a shout out on the show if you leave some positive feedback. But you leave any trolling and abusive comments, you just get blocked. Yeah, we're just not going to engage with it. If we get any that are really funny, we might read them out on the show at some point. But generally speaking, we're just going to block. We're not going to engage. So just just, just don't. Speaking of people, places people can leave nice feedback, where can people find us on the internet? All of the places. On Instagram, we're Women VS Everything. On Twitter, we're WV Everything Pod. Uh, we have a Facebook page. And yeah, there's also some places where you can give us money. Yes, so we are on Patreon. Uh, It's patreon.com slash women vs everything. Uh, That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N. And we are also at buymeacoffee.com slash WV everything pod. You can't see it because this is an audio format, but I'm holding my coffee cup up to the camera. You can feed my feed my caffeine addiction. (laughs) Speaking of caffeine addiction, I've only had one coffee in the last 10 days. Oh my god, are you okay? Uh, so, like, I'm definitely a highly sensitive person, and I've always been like, caffeine is not, I have a bit of a love, well, my body has a love-hate relationship with it. (laughs) Mm -hmm. The part of me that likes (laughs) to get buzzed has a love relationship with it. But yeah, it was really interesting, I, like, I just could, I had it at, like, two, half two yesterday, and I could not get to sleep last night. So, oh, wow. yeah, I like, I've definitely known I'm, I've always been someone who is more sensitive to mm. caffeine, but I just built up such a tolerance between coffee and soft drinks that I think it's like, for now, I'm taking a break. <laughs> that's, that's fair. That's fair. I've been, I've been cutting back a little bit. I realized at the point that I was drinking six to eight double espressos a day that that was maybe not going to be great. No. I, I, I don't know. I, I'm not sure I can handle quite that quantity of caffeine in the way I used to be able to. So I've been cutting back a little bit, but I've got my Americano here and it's very nice. So I'm still still drinking some. Hey, and I still got my chocolate ice cream, so. <laughs> oh, oh, good choice. Yeah. Oh, I had some really good ice cream yesterday. So at the time that we were recording this, it was my birthday yesterday. I went to a gelato shop with my partner and ate a lot of ice cream. It was very good. Oh my God, that sounds so nice. Happy birthday, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. I am 31 now and I still don't feel like I've celebrated my 30th properly because plague times. Oh. (laughs) It's fine. Speaking of the plague, weren't you telling me in our little pre-chat that you got your second vaccine? 
yeah, I got my second vaccine. You know, I have some chronic health issues, so please don't let this discourage you from getting the vaccine. This is just my experience, but like my immune system is always a little bit struggling, to be honest. <laughs> and yeah, it's, you know, making these new antibodies and everything just seemed to, to be the straw that broke the camel's back a little bit this time. And I just ended up the next yeah. day catching this vomiting bug that was going around. And then I just sore throat and I yeah, just these virus that were around for the last while I just caught all of them back to back so mm. I've had a pretty rough week and I'm still pretty exhausted but um if I got COVID it would be much worse than this you know so it's worth it yes yeah. yes yes so get vaccinated this is a pro-vaccine podcast Absolutely, absolutely. I have had post viral fatigue or CFS ME in the past. You know, I still sometimes get flare ups of it. Mm -hmm. I kind of had one big initial flare up that lasted three years, and I just really do not want to get the the long COVID. That they're they're kind of calling the same thing now, the post viral fatigue from COVID. It's not yeah. fun. Whether you, even if you turn metallic or whatever <laughs> from from the vaccination. That is such a better option than getting post-viral fatigue. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I tried to get my second vaccine shot the other day by going to a walk-in site, which was a little bit of a gamble because I drove like an hour to get there, which was probably, it, and I knew it was a long shot, but I thought they might do it because it had been like three and a half weeks and supposedly the three, three weeks is about the optimal point to get the second shot with Pfizer. But they said, no, it's got to be 12 weeks, which is not true. So I was really annoyed all the way home. But it's fine. It's fine. Worst case scenario, I'm going to get my second one on the 20th of July, so it's not too long now. No. And good old public funding doesn't always lead to the best practice being followed. <laughs> it, it feels like an absolute gamble, just depending on where in the country you are, whether there will even be walk-in sites, whether they will do it, how what they're going to be like with the timing. It's... Yeah, I hate that there's so little consistency about this. It's really infuriating. In a slight moment of normality, I went to a restaurant for the first time in over a year this <gasps> week. I'm so jealous. It was good. It was what very good. Get? I enjoyed it. Tell me about the food. Oh yeah, the food was very good. So uh, for the starter, me and my partner shared a vegetarian platter which had things like fried halloumi and veggies and hummus and some really nice homemade bread which is very good. The main, I had a jackfruit burger. And then for the dessert, I had a very gooey, fudgy, chocolate orange cake. It was great. It was really good. Yay! That was, that was our week. Shall we dive into the topic? Go on. Yeah, so I actually have a, have a slightly funny story about this, which I, I told Grace just before we, we hit record. Um, so the, the info that Grace sent me was Egypt 1479 to 1458. And I had a slight reading accident with the dates and didn't realise they were going backwards and, real and and assumed that this was 15th century AD. And then realised halfway through research that what she was actually talking about was 1479 to 1558 BC, which is a very different time period. Um, so I had to kind of stop halfway through and kind of rethink my whole approach to this, which is absolutely fine. Because conveniently, there's a lot more information out there about ancient Egypt than there is about... Well, there's a lot about ancient Egypt and there's quite a lot about modern Egypt. But the, like, thousand years in the middle, there is very, very little. So I was really struggling, so I'm glad that I actually got to research a period that there is info about. So ancient Egypt, one of the oldest civilizations in the world since around 3150 BC, according to most sources. That's like 5,000 years, that's a long time. What I found really interesting about this was that, in many ways, women in ancient Egypt actually had a lot more rights than I would have initially expected when I first started researching this topic. This source says that they had some special rights that women did not have in other comparable societies. Um, so women could own property in kind of court and legal matters, they were considered essentially legally equal to men. Doesn't mean that things were entirely equal. There were female rulers, there were even female pharaohs. But generally speaking, women could not have important high-level positions in administration. Women at the royal court generally gained their positions via their relationship to male kings and important male figures rather than on their own merit. It was a male-dominated society, but it's a lot less unequal than people might think. Most people belong to the, uh, the lower classes, the peasantry, and in that kind of society, 
women worked alongside their husbands, so women often managed farms or businesses. In the upper classes, women didn't usually work outside of the home, but they would take on kind of a supervisory role, supervising the servants of the household and the children's education. The exception to this is in the textile industry, where women, a lot of women, worked as, uh, as weavers. So in what's known as the Old Kingdom, which was slightly earlier than this period that we're talking about today, women often had their own households, men and women would work side by side, and it was pretty common to find that there would be women with administrative titles, women being served by servants and things. It also says in tomb scenes of the period, men are often served by men while women are served by women. Here the separation of the sexes is visible, which I thought was interesting. Women who were wealthy enough to hire people to help with childcare, people to look, to look after their children, were often worked in other roles, so they might work in the courts or in the temples, they might be singers, dancers, musicians, perfume makers, and all of these were considered kind of respectable pursuits for upper class women to do. Mm. And noble women could even be members of the priesthood in which they would be connected typically to a certain god or goddess. Mm -hmm. Marriage was considered very important and the purpose of marriage was primarily to have lots of children and have lots of descendants for the husband's family. In the New Kingdom, which is the period that we're kind of talking about, which I'll go on to in a minute, there's a saying that begins, take a wife while you are young that she will make a son for you. <laughs> Having lots of children and lots of sons in particular was very, very important. Typically marriages were uh, monogamous, but it was not also not particularly uncommon for a, a man of high economic status to have multiple wives, particularly if his first wife was unable to have children. Mm. Divorce was possible, but it was pretty difficult, um, and marriages were usually arranged by parents. So typically in that situation, a, a man of, of a high economic status would take a second wife rather than divorce his wife and remarry because they were allowed to do that. There's kind of general evidence that women made quite a lot of decisions in the family, had quite a lot of control over the home and over the household, um, and that husbands didn't take control over their wives' property, unlike many other societies. Wow! Yeah, it, you know, if you'd asked me going into this, what kind of women's rights do you think there would have been, I'd have kind of assumed, well, very little. Yeah. And, it, and that's really not the case at all, which is really, really interesting. In a way, they have more freedoms than the time of the suffragettes. You know, like. Oh yeah, massively. In many ways, they have more freedoms than women in many societies today, which is... Yes wild. I also looked into the kind of politics and government and things of the time and of course the most important person in an ancient Egyptian society was the pharaoh which I didn't actually know this fun fact the word pharaoh literally means great house oh yeah and is a reference to the palace where the ruler would reside so in very early ancient Egypt they were they were called kings but over time the name pharaoh stuck and they were considered to be not just the head of the state, but also a religious leader, a kind of intermediary between the people and the gods. So they were in charge of maintaining religious harmony, as well as making laws and overseeing everything that was happening in the, in the country and, and all, of, all of those things. So the time that we're talking about is a period that's known as the 18th dynasty, from about 1550 to 1292 BC. And that's considered to be the first dynasty of the New Kingdom of Egypt, uh, which is the era in which ancient Egypt achieved pretty much the height of its power. Mm. Yeah, so several of the most famous pharaohs that people will have heard of were from the 18th dynasty, including Tutankhamun and Akhenaten, maybe, I'm saying that right? And his wife uh, Nefertiti, who people have probably heard of as well. And interestingly, this period had two women who ruled as pharaoh in their own right. And this episode is about one of them. <laughs> I figured it might be. I wonder, when I was reading this, I was like, I wonder if that's where this is going. I wonder if it's going to be one of them. Tell us about the person. Yeah, so this episode is about Hatshepsut, mm -hmm. who was the longest reigning female pharaoh in Egypt, ruling for 20 years in the 15th century BC. And she is considered by Egyptologists as one of Egypt's most successful pharaohs. So I chose this person as a response to, like, I noticed that I was going with a lot of contemporary women. And the reason why was I just felt like, no, like, like proper history, like why you choose Jess. I was just like, no, I'm just, I'm just not smart enough for any of that. You know, <laughs> like, I'm just, I'm not going to get it and I'm going to pronounce everything wrong and stuff. So 
Listen, Egyptologists out there, I am so sorry in advance. <laughs> this is me kind of like in martial arts, smashing my head through the wooden plank of my anxiety. <laughs> And if you are a cool female Egyptologist, come and speak on our show, you know. Come on our show, yes, absolutely. I remember you said this is the furthest back that we've gone, and I was thinking even even in if it, if if I'd been right that it had been AD, I think it would have been because I think correct me if I'm wrong, but I th- I think other than this, the, the the furthest back in history was the Catherine Howard episode, which was like 1530s AD. Mm-hmm. So this is like, this is like a thousand years before <laughs> anything we've talked about before, which is really, really cool. So I, I love this topic. Yeah. So I had a lot of fun researching it too. Um, so Hatshepsut, or some people say Hatshepsut, was the only child born to the Egyptian king Thutmose, or Tetmosa the first by his principal wife and queen, Atmos. She was expected to be queen. So from a very young age, she would have been in training to be the sacred wife of Amun, which she became at 10 years old. And Amun was the patron god of Thebes, creative god. And it was believed that like he fertilized the universe alone. And God's wife of Amun, which was her status after doing this training, was second only to Amun's direct priests, you know, so she had a wow. huge place of spiritual power. And she would expect be expected to perform spiritual offerings, sing at festivals, dance, host festivals, and she stood by her father's side at really important events. So she would have had access to the best economic, spiritual and cultural tutors from a very young age, how to build, how to win wars, Um, and lead propaganda campaigns, which is really interesting. In this, we see suggestions of the use of propaganda. Mm. So she had quite a traumatic time here where her two brothers died and her father died. And she was married to, I don't know the exact chronological order, but she also married to her brother, who was Thutmose second. Yeah, inbreeding was very, very common. Yeah, my understanding yeah. is it was particularly common in these very powerful yeah. families within the kind of ro- royalty and 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 that sort of that sort of environment. Yeah, he was quite a weak and sickly person, but this would have been like mm. her, you know. So not only was she the wife of Amun the god, but her bloodline was now impeccable because she's the daughter, sister, and wife of a king. You know, so during this reign, which was Thutmose the second, is her husband. She assumed the traditional wife of queen and principal wife because he did have a harem, uh, like you said, the, a lot of the higher class men would have. And she was still a teenager at this point, And her husband died when she was only 16. Oh, my goodness. Um, she sadly had no sons. But Thutmose the second had a male baby from a member of his. He had a few male babies from members of his harem, but they were all still infants. So Hatshepsut, <laughs> Hatshepsut, <laughs> I've been chanting that word all week, put on this very grand ceremony where a statue of the god Amun chose the next leader, you know, and this was very much as a way to quell the public anxiety about a lack of new heir and stop a new dynasty coming in and taking advantage of the fact that they didn't have a very clear heir. So Mm -hmm. there was some sort of ceremony where the statue chose a male infant who was Thutmose the third, just to confuse me. Um, Well, fun fun fact about that. um, This is something that came up in my my research is that this 18th dynasty period was also known as the Thutmose dynasty (laughs) because there were four pharaohs with that name. (laughs) (laughs) Well, this is the third one and all this happened all these thousands of years ago, just so I would be here tripping over my words on a podcast one day. So, <laughs> um, so she went to be regent with her now stepson and nephew <laughs> and now co-ruler. Wow. She bore the role a bit traditionally, but then for reasons that are still a bit unclear, but I think she was a very cunning woman. I, I think she would have created the situation that then she would have claimed the role of pharaoh. So she didn't usurp the crown because Thutmose III was never deposed and was considered her co-ruler throughout her life. But it was very clear she was the principal ruler in power. 
and even as he became an adult he didn't seem to have any massive moves towards taking that title from her. Oh, interesting. So she is actually the second historically considered uh, confirmed female pharaoh. The first was someone called Sabek Neferu. There's been lots of other pharaohs regents. So even though, like you said, women could have a relatively high status in ancient Egypt, uh, it was still unusual for women to be pharaoh and it wasn't well received. So there was lots of putting people in power with reminders of, you know, remember that I put you here. Lots of bribing went on, lots of creative taxes and buildings, that kind of, it just became this, again, this, this technique of like winning over public opinion. She began having herself depicted in the traditional king's kilt, like the crown with the fake beard and a male body like we see in the traditional pharaohs. I've actually got a picture of that in front of me from one of my one of my sources. It's a um I think it's like a stone carving of, yeah. of her and she's got the she's got the kind of the headdress that you'd see in traditional Egyptian art and she's got the yeah the, the fake beard and things. It's mm, it's really interesting. We'll have to share this on our on our Instagram. Yeah definitely. And it wasn't an attempt to trick people into thinking she was male. It was just like there was no words or images to portray someone who is a woman with this status. So it was just mm -hmm. like, this is what a pharaoh looks like and I'm the pharaoh now, you know? So it was kind of beyond gender in some ways is how I interpret it. And the previous yeah. Soba Kneferu did the same. So it's really interesting. Some statues show her in female coated dress and some in royal attire and some are first one and then recarved to be the other. That is really interesting. Yeah. So it's, yeah, as you say, it's, it's kind of, transcending gender and it's it's not about looking like a man it's about looking like a ruler and this is what that society has decided that a, a ruler a person in that position looks like that the headdress and the beard weren't gendered they were just that's what a pharaoh wears you know that's yeah. so interesting yeah I'm like good for her <laughs> <laughs> yeah what about us we love her yeah, and, and you mentioned earlier, Jess, about like the spiritual aspect as well of, yes. of ruling this country. And she was really big on that, obviously being like the sacred wife of Amun and had all this training to, to do that. So the pharaoh at the time was considered the living embodiment of the male god Horus. So that might be again why, as a pharaoh, she was depicted in, in male form. So there was a tradition called Mat, M-A-A-T, which was truth expressing a belief in order and justice. So disturbance to the gendered aspect of being the ruler and this male god Horus was considered to go against Matt, against this principle of truth. Mm -hmm. So she renamed herself Matt Kara or truth is the soul of the sun god, which was another oh, move wow. in this kind of strategic propaganda, you know? The sources I've read also suggest that it was around this time this legend was released. So it wasn't like, oh, there was this legend in existence anyway about her birth. They seem to suggest it was around this time also that a legend came about that um actually her birth was a spiritual an event, that her conception was through the gods. Oh, wow. Amun, the state god, went to her mother, Ahmos, in the form of Thutmose the first. So Amun the state god dressed up as Thutmose and awakened her with some pleasant odors and placed the sake <laughs> place. I really like this story. <laughs> I'm like, yo, <laughs> this sounds really hot. Um, and placed the sacred <laughs> ank, the symbol of life close to her nose. And Hatshepsut was conceived through mm. Amos and this god. And then Knum, K-H-N-U-M, the god who forms bodies of human children, was then instructed to create a body for Hatshepsut. Heket, the goddess of life and fertility, and Knum then led Ahmos along to a lioness bed, which is where she gave birth to Hatshepsut. Wow. And there's reliefs depicting each step in these events at Karnak and her mortuary temple. So, I mean, we're talking one, two, three, three deities kind of helping her form in her mom's womb. And of course, religion was tremendously important in this culture and the, the gods held held so much power. And as I mentioned, the pharaoh was essentially seen to be the, the representative or the intermediary between the gods and, and the people. So yes. 
the amount of sway and power that that story would have given her is kind of astounding. Yes. Outside of the spiritual aspect, Hatshepsut also has so many achievements, and she was also very good at promoting her achievements. So she re-established trade networks, creating great wealth. She had loads of trading expeditions, one of which resulted in the first recorded attempt to plant foreign trees in a foreign land. Oh, wow. So, yeah, the, a very famous expedition was that myrrh trees were brought from Punt, which is now considered a part of Somalia. So there was a really famous expedition to there, and they also brought back frankincense, which resulted in the first recorded use of resin in coal eyeliner. Oh, wow. Which I think is so iconic. Her foreign policy was very peaceful, and Egyptologists can only really speculate about one or two military campaigns, but in general, in her reign, there was no assassinations, coups, or alliances with any powerful male generals. It was a very slow-paced, patient, solidifying her power over a long period of time type of reign. Oh, interesting. So she wasn't about going out and waging war and conquering and no. all of those things. No, mm. instead she also focused her time on being one of the most prolific builders in Egypt. See, this all of this is like a great argument for let women be in charge. I know, right? <laughs> Completely. There's a really funny TikTok going around of someone being like, oh, we're meant to believe like men can't control themselves when they see women wearing skimpy outfits, but we put them in charge of countries. <laughs> <You know>? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this one is like one of the most prolific builders in Egypt. And actually some people that came after her <laughs> tried to claim her buildings as their own as well, because they were so great. Really? Wow, it's the, like the earliest known historical example of men taking credit for women's achievements. Oh my god, we've got a lot of that coming up. Oh, I'm not surprised, sadly. <laughs> yeah. Almost every major museum with ancient Egyptian artefacts in the world has Hatshepsut's statutory amongst their collections. She has a whole room dedicated to herself in New York City's Metropolitan Museum of Art. Oh, wow. Well, that's another one to add to the list for the great women versus everything road trip someday. Absolutely. And to Egypt to see all the ruins that you can yes. see. Like there's ruins in Thebes and Karnak. You can visit her mortuary temple. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> Fun personal fact here. This is completely unrelated to the story, except that it's to do with ancient Egypt. But um, one of the very first like days that my partner and I spent together before we were dating was visiting an ancient Egypt exhibit at uh, the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford. Oh my god, that's so cute and geeky. I love it. It was really cute and geeky. It was it was fun. Shout out to the Ashmolean in Oxford. We went to quite good exhibition on witchcraft there once as well. Oh, cool. Uh, anyway, just a little, little um, vaguely Egypt-related personal anecdote there. We love it. Sidebar nation. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so 20 years after her death, toward the end of the reign of Thutmose the third, the baby. Who was her stepson slash nephew. Yeah. And into the reign of his son, so somewhere at the end of that his reign and at the start of his son's reign, there was an was attempt... Was his son Thutmose the fourth? I don't know. I just... <laughs> <laughs> Let's just say yes. Listen, and his son was also probably his brother and uncle and... <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the level of inbreeding is very upsetting. <laughs> it's very upsetting. Look up the Habsburg jaw. It's, yeah, amazing. Very creepy. So yeah, at that time, there was an attempt made to remove Hatshepsut from certain historical records. There's a Latin word here, damnatio memori, damnation of memory. The elimination was carried out in the most literal way possible. Her images were chiseled off stone walls, leaving very obvious her shaped gaps in the artwork. Oh, wow. Yeah, the most popular suspect is Thutmose III himself, but, you know, he never made a play for the throne in the time he was alive, where mm. she was still the co-regent, and they're not sure, but they think it was a censoring for honour and... It was believed that damaging images in this way would also like condemn someone in the afterlife. And it seems whoever did this didn't want that for her because in the more like urban areas, the images still exist, you know, so they just wanted her cleared from the readily accessed records in the cities. 
Oh, that's really interesting. Yeah, so it seems sad. Yeah. Yeah, that is. Wow. And yet, so somehow just so unsurprising that a woman who manages to claim and hold a position of power that is typically reserved for men, that they would try to erase her from history. That's terrible. Yeah. So she is thought to have died as she approached middle age. In June 2007, a discovery was made in the Valley of the Kings. A mummy was discovered in the tomb of Hatshepsut's uh, royal nurse. And a tooth fragment was found in a jar of organs, which was used to identify the body to be Hatshepsut's. Oh, wow. So if that identification of her mummy is correct, the medical evidence would indicate she suffered from diabetes and died of bone cancer, which would have spread throughout her body when she was in her 50s. And it would have Mm. also suggested she had arthritis and bad teeth. I think bad teeth were very common in the sandy Ah. desert. And I I don't actually know if this is true. I'm speculating here, but it it seems to me like in those days, maybe 50s would have been considered actually a pretty good age. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm guessing a lot of people died relatively young and and that actually getting to 50 something was pretty impressive yeah in 2011 the tooth was identified as a molar from a lower jaw whereas the the mummy they thought was hatshepsut is missing a molar from its upper jaw so now there's doubt about that identification her mortuary temple is still admired today and was a remarkable find in archaeology and the images on it are where we get most of her story from that is true by the way i just found a source here from ucl in london yeah and it says people in ancient egypt did not grow very old very high infant death rates due to high risk of infections resulted in an average age of death of 19 years however those who survived childhood had a life expectancy of 30 years for women and 34 years for men wow so 50s she's doing pretty well yeah so if if that is her yeah. There's also the cult of Osiris, another god. It, it was believed that when, when a pharaoh died, they, they were then depicted as Osiris with the mm. body and the regalia of that deity. So all the statues in her tomb follow that tradition and the promise of resurrection after death was a tenet of the cult of Osiris. So that's just more evidence again about that spiritual link that she was indeed a pharaoh. And on Knum's pottery wheel she's depicted as a little boy so it's again thought this is like further cement to the argument that she had a divine right to rule the earliest attestation of her as pharaoh occurs in the tomb of ramos and hatnofer where a collection of grave goods contained a single pottery jar from the tomb's chamber, which was stamped with the date year seven, and another jar from the same tomb, which was discovered in situ by 1935 to 36 Metropolitan Museum of Art Expedition on a hillside near Thebes, was stamped with the seal of God's wife, Hatshepsut. Um, and two jars bore the seal of the good goddess Matkar, or Matkare, which was the, 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 the truth. Matt meaning the truth, divine, divine truth. And it's pretty undispu- undisputed that, that these runes I just mentioned mean that she was acknowledged as the king and not the queen of Egypt by year seven of her reign. Mm. So going back half a step, we know that her stepson slash nephew kind of tried to erase her afterwards. Aside from just boring common or garden misogyny, do we know why? No, it's a mystery as to who did it. Like I said, it's just thought he's the most likely suspect. Mm. I can only imagine, yeah, that maybe a more conservative believing crowd came in and kind of like, you know, she was working the propaganda machine so hard during her reign that then when she passed away and wasn't there to pump that wheel anymore people became more vocal about their criticism of what had happened and maybe it was seen as something that should have been covered up. Yeah, absolutely. I've just found this article on todayifoundout.com and I don't know I don't know how well researched or how accurate this is, but it, it speculates on this a little bit, which is interesting. And it says it was originally speculated that he did this, that's erased her, out of anger for her usurping his throne earlier in life. However, given that about two decades passed before he bothered and the seemingly good relationship the pair had during her rule, as commander of Egypt's armies and the rightful heir, he could have overthrown her with little difficulty if he had really wanted to. Uh, it says, today it's theorised that this act was probably more about legitimising his own son's rule 
Yeah. And it's even possible that it was his son. Oh, his son who was not thingy, what's it, the fourth. His son was Am Amenhotep the second. It's theorised that he might even be the one who, who ordered it. But it's all, obviously, it's all speculation. No one really knows for sure. Yeah, I don't think so either, because he just could have snapped his fingers and become the full pharaoh himself in the time yeah, she was alive. Yeah. As it says, like, he literally could have overthrown her if he'd wanted to. Yeah. I, I really don't think it was him. I think that theory that it was the son and maybe, like, this was... It was looked back on, like, damaging information about the lineage of pharaohs or something. Yeah. In this really, in this in this article, there's this bit right, it just finishes right at the end with Hatshepsut was worried about how she would be remembered or if she would be remembered at all as a as a female pharaoh. And there's this obelisk. It's been translated into English as, "Now my heart turns this way and that, as I think, what will the people say? Those who see my monuments in years to come, and who shall speak of what I have done?" Beautiful, isn't it? That that's really speaking to how. That, that maybe there was this level of awareness even then that they might try to cut her out of the history books, so to speak, and might try to erase her contributions to the culture. Yeah, that's absolutely heartbreaking. Mm, yeah. But joke's on them. <laughs> Three and a half thousand years later, maybe? We're still talking about her, so yay, they failed. No, uh, I don't know, because I, I feel a bit like everyone has heard of Cleopatra. Oh yeah, she's she's relatively unknown. That's that's you very know, true. I just um, I wish yeah, Hatshepsut was heard of more, considering she had a lot to celebrate. You know, we've a lot to celebrate about her. Yeah, she sounds like a badass. Yeah. So there we go. That's my attempt at like proper old history. <laughs> <laughs> I love it though. Like, what a what a great story. That's fantastic. Yeah, and I think another one that I just saw on, like, a Facebook meme that someone shared. Yeah, it's funny, isn't it? I keep, like, hearing about these awesome women and Kira passing mention of someone. I'll be like, oh my god, we need to talk about them on the podcast. Yeah, I have a spreadsheet. <laughs> I have a very messy series of notes saved on my phone. <laughs> You're yes. more organised than me, I love it. So, yeah, that's the story of Hatshepsut, a woman that they tried to erase from history and failed well done she's iconic to ancient egypt it's, it's it's interesting actually i um i sort of felt like we couldn't really talk about ancient egypt without kind of talking also a little bit about women's rights in egypt today mm. as we as we established like in, in in many ways it was more of an equal society than people might expect i think it's just interesting to kind of consider how that compares to what um, what the culture there is like today. And it, it seems as though in many ways women have fewer rights and more constraints now. So it's very much traditional there for women to have limited contact with men. So women are often expected to cover their heads or their faces, so veiling is very common, um, gender segregation in schools, at work, in recreational activities. And particularly in um, lower class families, it's, uh, there's a tendency to uh, withdraw girls from school when they reach puberty. So as of 2015, 14.9% of the parliament in Egypt was female. Only 43% of women over 25 had at least a secondary level of education. That was as of 2010. Wow. And as of 2014, only 26% of women were in the workforce. There was a 2010 poll done by the Pew Research Centre that was kind of trying to assess attitudes to gender equality. Uh, and it showed that around 45% of men and 76% of women were in favour of gender equality. Generally, people tended to accept that women should have the right to work outside of the home. But at the same time, only 11% of men and 36% of women completely agreed that that should be the case. 75% overall agreed that, quote, when jobs are scarce, men should have more right to a job. Wow. Okay. So equality, but not really. Yeah, which is really interesting. So, so tragically, there was a 2012 report from UNICEF that said that 87% of women and girls between 15 and 49 had undergone female genital mutilation, or FGM, which was made illegal in 2008, but is still practiced quite a lot. The first person who were to be tried for committing it uh, was a doctor in 2014, but he was found not guilty. 
Yeah. So in a 2013 poll by gender rights experts, Egypt ranked worst for women's rights out of all the Arab states. Really? Mm, apparently so, yeah, which I was I was surprised by, actually. I feel like we hear a lot about Saudi Arabia and, and countries yeah. that America says they need to invade. <laughs> <laughs> right, absolutely. There was another piece that I that I pulled from one of my sources that I thought was really important to acknowledge, which talks about the ways that gender discrimination and sexual discrimination, which clearly is very strong, also plays into uh, essentially Western Islamophobia. Mm. Um, so it reads, a, com a common misconception about the prevalence of sexual discrimination in the Middle East is the notion of, quote, Islamic misogyny. This is given as the reason for women's second-class citizenship. However, it undermines the feminist movement in, in Egypt at large and provides a superficial explanation for women's fight as human beings for their basic rights. I think what they're really saying there is that it's, it's very important not to fall into the trap of blaming Islam as a whole for this gender discrimination, because that's not really what it's about. Yes, absolutely. One more quick fact is, so the, liter the literacy rate of women uh, as of, from data from 2015 was 65.4%. That was women aged 15 and over. And for men, uh, the rate was 82.2%. Yeah. Part of that is because a lot of Egypt is rural and access to education is quite poor in a lot of rural areas. Yeah. But also the, the gender disparity is, as we, as we mentioned, because a lot of families are pulling girls out of school much earlier if they, if they get any schooling at all. And is arranged marriage an issue in Egypt? I'm only asking because I imagine if you were going to pull, if you'd, you know, a boy and a girl and you were going to pull one out of school for labouring on the farm, it would be the boy. So are the girls being pulled out of school younger to actually earn earn their dowry, essentially? Mm, it is definitely a, a thing, but a thing that is happening. So there's an article here from Egypt Today of in, uh, that was written in 2017. It says that arranged marriages are usually referred to as, quote, salon marriages. Uh, because couples usually meet for the first time in the sitting room at the bride's house under the supervision of the family. And it says that even premarital friendships between men and women can be can be frowned upon in certain um, sectors of society. So this is a way to kind of satisfy family pressure to get married, but also preserve one's reputation, which for, for women is, is absolutely vital. And there is this quote from someone who works in the, quote, marriage trade, so who's essentially helping to essentially working as a matchmaker to arrange these these marriages um which typically they can happen in as little as six months there's someone here who says that it's just a way to meet people if you can't find someone that you like in your circle of acquaintance she says it's like a job interview when you're recommended by the matchmaker your chances are higher you get to tell the matchmaker what you're looking for and she does the job for you yeah i mean i've i've definitely met people that like arrange marriages as more like asking your parents to like ask around do they know any eligible boys and kind of like your parents are just fixing you up on a blind date really but the other thing I'm wondering about is child marriage mm, yeah mm. oh that's interesting um hmm. yeah because if they're pulling them out of second level education then we're still only talking about teenagers so there's this article here from the Egypt Independent that says that around 600,000 women were married before 18 which is the legal age of consent nope um, yeah, the average yeah. age of marriage is 20 for women and 26 for men, and the law forbids marriage under the age of 18, but marriage at an, early, at an earlier age is still a, is still a societal problem, particularly in um, certain rural areas. Yeah, you could link that evidence together and propose that, like, it is, it is really that you're pulled out of education, you know, that the families are reliant on the dowry. Yeah, this first article that I was reading, this Egypt Today article, there's also an interesting bit further down that's really sad that says beauty to men is being fair-skinned and that this person who's essentially attempting to arrange these marriages she said that many women are primarily rejected for not being quote light enough yeah yeah which is in is which sort of ties back to the conversation that we had with amy emmy in uh, the interview last week where she was talking about these incredibly western european beauty standards that are so so prevalent Yes, yeah, and that and like really co sad. colorism is increasingly becoming a problem within many communities. Yeah, that's very sad. So, so yes, I just, I just thought it was important to kind of consider, you know, in the last three and a half thousand years, how things changed and what did it look like then versus what it looks like today. Really frightening how 
a society can go backwards. I think in, in modern in modern times we often have this tendency to look back on ancient civilizations and see them as very primitive and make assumptions that they must have been obviously very, very socially conservative and often that just doesn't mm. really stand up. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. No, it, yeah, it makes total sense for me and I just find it terrifying how um, a country can, as time goes on, actually go, actually remove more and more rights from its uh, citizens, especially women. Like looking at Texas today where abortion has been made illegal by a panel of men. What? Completely? It's still legal, but they've made it that essentially no women will be able to access it. Yeah, I mean, that's that's one of those where the, the cutoff is so early that it's the po at the point where many people don't even know that they're pregnant. Yeah, six weeks, which is one period you could presume is a bit late. Yeah, yeah, that is absurd. Like, wow. So I just, that you know, horrendous. my point of all of this is I just feel like <laughs> The Handmaid's Tale isn't actually so far away. <laughs> Well, I was thinking about this the other day, actually, because did you see that terrible thing that the World Health Organization put out? Oh my god! I'm so glad um, you brought that up. For anyone who mercifully missed this, the World Health Organization put something out the other day where they suggested that any women of, quote, childbearing age should not be allowed to drink alcohol, regardless of whether they're pregnant, regardless of whether they have any intention to become pregnant. Uh, just generally, there's a potential possibility that their bodies are capable of being pregnant and therefore they should not drink alcohol. Um, which I, I think my response was just... Like, Who are they? <laughs> what in the dystopian Handmaid's Tale hell is this? Of course, there was massive, massive outcry about this. I don't think they've retracted it. Not that I've seen. Maybe they have. No, they haven't. No, even though the, the statistics for alcohol-related deaths are higher for men. It's so, so maddening in general that it's 2021 and women and people with uteruses are being reduced to nothing but our reproductive capacity and even our potential that we could possibly be pregnant at some point. It's, yeah, it, I, I don't have words. It's, it's horrifying and it made me so mad and I read it like three days ago and I'm still mad. And particularly as someone who's like, I'm never having children and frankly you can prize my G&T out of my cold dead hands, WH so. <laughs> <laughs> it just makes no sense i really want to be a fly in the room where they came to this conclusion because it just it just makes no sense yeah yeah and i just yeah my scientist cousin shout out emma and i were talking about it yesterday and she was like you know we're in a world pandemic when we really need people to be on side of science mm -hmm. and trusting science and this yeah. is what they choose to do of all the things they could have gone after Mm. Like, seriously? Oh, uh, well, that's all the things that are wrong with the world. If you see any contemporary news or articles that come up on your newsfeed that you think would be fun for us to discuss and have mini rants about, send them our way. We have a Gmail yep. account, womenvseverything at gmail.com. We, yeah. we would love some help with that. <laughs> G yeah, get in touch. Let us know. What should, we be, what should we be yelling about in future episodes? We're going to get shrill. <laughs> <laughs> I want that on a t-shirt. Shall we do gratitude things? Go on, let's do our basic bitch gratitude list. I am grateful for... All the people who... Going back to what we were saying a second ago with these... these terrible things that, that these organizations are saying i'm grateful for all the people who've spoken out against it mm. and all the people who've rallied together to say no this is ridiculous stop because that's what we need we need this kind of shared pushing back and shared outcry to make these things not happen i'm grateful for all my lovely friends and community as i as i mentioned at the beginning it was my birthday yesterday and i just I just felt really super loved, like obviously it's hard to see a lot of people at the moment, we're still in the pandemic times, but I got lots of lovely messages and one of my lovely friends sent me some flowers which are beautiful. Yeah, I just just felt really felt really loved, which was which was great. So I'm very grateful for all the fabulous people in my life. And coffee. Always coffee. <laughs> what about you? Um Oh god, I'm grateful for my dog and a really nice time in the park I had yesterday. Yay! Yeah, I'm grateful for like FGM charities and people who are like on the absolute battlefront of all these 
horrific things happening. Maybe we should link to a couple of those charities on our social media so if people want to donate they can. Yes, I'll put it in our link tree. Yeah, I'm just, I'm grateful for it's Father's Day in Ireland, so yeah, shout out to my dad. Oh yes, it is in England too. Um, yes, also shout out to my dad who is wonderful. It was just hilarious because I, I texted him this morning and said happy Father's Day and he texted me back and said lol, I didn't even know that was today. <laughs> My dad was wearing a polo shirt with like, you know, like they have a the little Lacoste alligator, but it was like yeah. a shark instead. So I've just been like <laughs> singing daddy shark at him like all morning, wrecking his head. Oh no. Uh, yeah, I know. Don't hate me. Don't hate me. Um, I also, have you watched Kim's Convenience? Uh, I have not. Speaking of dads, it's like a really good series sadly ended but about a korean family that run a shop in toronto oh interesting no i i haven't seen it is it on like netflix or amazon it's or on netflix it's amazingly multicultural like it, it just really highlighted to me how quite often when i watch something everybody has the same accent because it's just mm. so many people with different accents on this it's really cool and um yeah the the dad in it and the daughter and I have a very similar relationship to me and my dad where we're just both incredibly stubborn and won't back down and wreck each other's heads but we love each other so yeah <laughs> <laughs> oh amazing yeah I will have to check that out yeah so until next time be a spiritual queen beyond gender and f love women <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. And we'll see you in two weeks. See you in two weeks. Bye. 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 <laughs>